Israel's very existence has never been more threatened than right now, not by Hamas, which lacks the means to defeat Israel militarily, but by its own actions. Not only is the nation suffering massive military losses in its difficult urban warfare, but Israel's extraordinary brutality in Gaza is uniting the entire world against it. Don't believe me? In a recent UN General Assembly vote, 174 countries, which represents 94% of the world's population, voted in favor of political self-determination for Palestine, while only four countries, including Israel and the US, voted against it. Last week, geopolitical experts from around the world gathered in Germany to attend the Munich Security Conference. The big takeaway from this conference is that Israel has become much more internationally isolated, including from friends and allies than they think. Israel now depends entirely on its one true remaining supporter and enabler of this war, which of course is the United States. But shockingly, even US support is now quickly diminishing. Almost 60% of Americans, that's nearly three in every five people, support a ceasefire with a dwindling 19% opposed. And yet, incredibly, some Israeli leaders are now openly calling for an even wider war in the Middle East. Acting on intelligence about Hamas and hostages, Israeli special forces raided the main hostage hospital in southern Gaza last Thursday, despite international calls for civilian protection. This coincides with Egypt's concerns over Israel's planned ground offensive in Rafah, where 1.4 million displaced Palestinians are sheltering. In today's video, I'll reveal the chilling truth behind Israel's real long-term goal in Gaza and beyond, and how it actually has nothing to do with defeating Hamas. The truth will shock you. Let's break it down. The Israeli government argues that it is in a moral fight for survival against Hamas, and therefore must take every measure, including the complete destruction of Gaza to survive. But the cold hard truth is that this is false. Let me explain. In all the years of Hamas rule in Gaza after 2007, Hamas has never captured Israeli territory, much less remotely threatened Israel's existence or survival. Frankly, it couldn't do even if it wanted to. Hamas has around 30,000 fighters, while the Israeli Defense Force has more than 600,000 active and reserve personnel. Hamas lacks an air force, armored vehicles, a military industrial base, and any geographical maneuverability outside of Gaza. In addition, Hamas launches many rockets, but almost all are intercepted or cause little damage. Simply put, Israel has vast military dominance and it's not even close. Importantly, October 7th was not the result of an upgraded or more deadly Hamas, but rather a shocking failure of Israeli security. Israeli leaders had ignored extensive warnings of an upcoming Hamas attack and inexplicably left the Gaza-Israel border severely undermanned. Even more astounding, they did so just days after Israeli extremists had stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque complex, one of Islam's holiest sites. Hamas exploited Israel's security lapse by easily breaching the border on October 7th. By now, it's also known that the Israeli civilian deaths on that horrific day were in part also caused by Israeli aerial bombing and crossfire in the IDF's counterattack. But by refortifying the border with Gaza, Israel has easily stopped further ground incursions by Hamas. What's disturbing is that Israel's utterly disproportionate military dominance extends to civilian deaths as well. Just take a look at this disturbing chart. Between 2008 and 2022, Hamas and other militants killed around a dozen Israeli civilians per year, while Israel usually killed at least 10 times more Palestinian civilians. There was a spike in 2014 when Israel invaded Gaza with 19 Israeli civilians killed versus 1,760 Palestinian civilians. And of course, October 7th, with around 1,100 Israeli civilians killed versus a whopping over 20,000 and counting Palestinian civilians, mostly women and children killed in Gaza. Now, the graph I just showed you was from January 3rd. As of today, the death count in Gaza has now crossed 28,000 innocent civilians. As such, there is simply no practical, geopolitical, legal, and much less ethical case for the destruction and genocidal brutality that Israel has inflicted on Palestinian civilians in Gaza. The narrative Israel is selling to its population that Gaza must be wiped out to ensure Israel's survival is being pushed by the same political class that let Israel's guard down in the lead up to October 7th. Simply put, Israeli leaders are seeking to cover up their blunders by obliterating Gaza. Now, if you think this is bogus and believe that Israel is engaging in a careful, precision targeting bombing campaign and doing its best to avoid civilian casualties, then let's simply listen to the direct quotes from Israel's top leaders. The whole Gaza Strip needs to be empty, 
flattened, just like in Auschwitz. Let it be a museum for all the world to see what Israel can do. Let no one reside in the Gaza Strip for all the world to see, because October 7th was in a way a second Holocaust. That was Israeli Mayor Matula David Azulai. Or take Israeli's finance minister, Bazalo Somotrich, a self-declared fascist who calls for Gaza's population to be cut to 100,000 to 200,000 down from the current population of more than 2 million. And then there's Israel's defense minister, Yovav Gallant, who stated that Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything. Over the years, Israel has responded to Hamas rockets with periodic massacres, as in 2014, and more regular airstrikes. The Israelis even have a chilling name for their periodic killing, called mowing the grass. It is common knowledge that inside Israel, that Hamas long served as a low-cost political prop used by Prime Minister Netanyahu to prove to Israelis that a two-state solution is impossible. And it's actually crucial to not forget that Netanyahu has actually backed Hamas for the sole purpose of dividing and weakening the Palestinian Authority, which has always been trying to make a two-state solution work. Late last year, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres summed up the current situation perfectly with the following spine-chilling statement. Gaza is becoming a graveyard for children. Hundreds of girls and boys are reportedly being killed or injured every day. Ground operations by the IDF and the continued bombardment are hitting civilians, hospitals, refugee camps, mosques, churches, and UN facilities, including shelters. No one is safe. If you're somehow still not convinced, then considered multiple outlets in mainstream media have been forced to admit just how extensive and indiscriminate Israel's carpet bombing of Gaza has become. Let's start with this groundbreaking article from The Guardian titled, How War Destroyed Gaza's Neighborhoods, Visual Investigation. Inside, you will find the most disturbing map that shows the damaged buildings in Gaza since October 7th. This is not Israel trying to eliminate Hamas. This is Israel trying to eliminate any future chances of normal life ever returning to Gaza. But how did Israel do this? I thought they were taking all the necessary precautions to reduce the loss of innocent civilian lives. Well, of course, this is the story we've all been sold. But the truth is revealed in this New York Times investigation, which opens with this chilling statement. During the first six weeks of the war in Gaza, Israel routinely used one of its biggest and most destructive bombs in areas it designated safe for civilians. The video investigation focuses on the use of 2,000 pound bombs in an area of southern Gaza where Israel had ordered civilians to move for safety. It later adds that since October, the U.S. has sent more than 5,000 MK-84 munitions to Israel, a type of 2,000-pound bomb. Or take this investigation by CNN, which shows disturbing footage of a 2,000-pound bomb being dropped on a Gaza refugee camp. It goes on to say that these 2,000-pound bombs are four times heavier than the largest bombs the U.S. dropped on ISIS in Iraq. Mark Garlasco, a former U.S. defense intelligence analyst and former U.N. war crimes investigator, verified CNN's report and said that the density of Israel's first month of bombardment in Gaza had not been seen since Vietnam. You have to go back to the Vietnam War to make a comparison. Even in both Iraq wars, it was never that dense. Munition experts have blamed the extensive use of these bombs for the soaring death toll in Gaza. But the fact that Israel deliberately used one of its most destructive bombs in one of the most densely populated areas on earth is frankly disgusting. But now we get to the crux of this issue. Netanyahu has ordered the flattening of Gaza not to protect Israel from Hamas, but to forcibly push out its entire population by making Gaza completely uninhabitable. This will allow him to fulfill his long-standing mission to gain total Israeli control over the territory, and more fundamentally, over all of greater Israel. That includes Israel of the pre-1967 war borders, plus Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. Basically, in other words, all the land from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Netanyahu gets the added bonus of clinging to power despite his grievous other failures. Greater Israel is home to roughly 7 million Jews and 7 million Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Christians. Clearly, Israel can rule Greater Israel only by utterly dominating 7 million Palestinians or by driving them out of their homes by war, 
violence, and extreme discrimination. This quest for greater Israel has led the nation to commit some of the gravest crimes against the people of Palestine, which is exactly what the International Court of Justice ruled when it confirmed that Israel is in fact plausibly committing genocide in Gaza. If you need further proof that this war really isn't about eliminating Hamas and instead preparing to dominate the entire future of Gaza, look at this new report which broke last week and showcases how Israel has given exploration licenses for natural gas in locations that are considered to be within Palestine's maritime boundary in preparation for occupying these areas. Of course, this new development has raised concerns over potential violations of international law, but let's be honest, these concerns have been raised over Israel's treatment of Palestine for decades, and there has never been any serious movements to actually hold Israel accountable to these international standards. Israel's attempt to violently create a greater Israel will fail. The IDF is suffering massive losses in the brutal urban warfare in Gaza. And while Israel has killed more than 28,000 Gazans, which are mostly women and children, it has not destroyed Hamas' capacity to resist Israel's invasion. IDF leaders say that defeating Hamas will require many more months, but well before then, global opposition will most likely become insurmountable. Some Israeli leaders are even openly calling for an even wider war in the Middle East. In addition, the the U.S. is in no position to continue unconditionally supporting Israel, much less fight a wider Middle Eastern war. After being stretched too thin and having drawn down its stockpile of munitions in both Ukraine and Gaza. The U.S. is also facing severe and costly diplomatic isolation as it defends Israel's indefensible actions. In recent votes of the U.S. Security Council and the U.N. General Assembly, the U.S. has stood almost alone in backing Israel's hyper-violent and unjust actions. This is hurting the U.S. in countless other areas of foreign policy and global economics. The American people strongly oppose yet another U.S. war, and their opposition will be heard in this election year, even by a Congress in the pocket of the military-industrial complex, and even by a government in which the Israel lobby holds an incredible amount of leverage and power. Military-related spending has also put the U.S. federal budget under tremendous stress, which has been a central factor in skyrocketing public debt, from around 35% of GDP in 2000 to a shocking 100% of GDP today. With soaring debts and the rise in interest rates on mortgage and consumer loans, the American people are resisting Biden's calls for more deficit spending to fund wars in Ukraine and Gaza. The U.S. and Arab countries should quickly agree on establishing a joint peacekeeping force to keep both sides safe in the context of implementing a two-state solution. But as we conclude today's video, I want to end with one important final thought, and that is moral clarity. Last year, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken stood next to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at a military base in Tel Aviv and said this, too often in the past, leaders have equivocated in the face of terrorist attacks against Israel and its people. This is, this must be a moment for moral clarity. Blinken was correct in this statement. Moral clarity requires the world to condemn the atrocities committed by Hamas on October 7th and the imprisonment of hostages as pure evil. But do these atrocities justify Israel's retaliation on Gaza that have so far killed over 29,000 Palestinians, including over 12,000 children? In addition, causing more than half a million people in Gaza to now face catastrophic hunger, equivalent to famine levels of starvation. Of course, the answer is a clear and resounding no. Condemning Benjamin Netanyahu and his government for wreaking disproportionate vengeance on innocent people in Gaza is not to be anti-Israel. It's actually to be pro-Israel. Remember my opening line from today's video. Israel's very existence has never been more threatened than right now. Not by Hamas, which lacks the means to defeat Israel militarily, but by its own actions. Israeli leaders and diplomats must stop shouting that critics are all anti-Semites and listen to what the world is actually saying. Israel and Palestine need to live side by side based on international law and mutual security. The support for a two-state solution is support for the peace and security of the Jewish people in the state of Israel, as well as support for the peace and security of the Palestinian people in the state of Palestine. By contrast, continuing to support Israel's genocide in Gaza, which increases anti-Israel and anti-US sentiment around the world, is completely and directly opposed to Israel's long-term security, and perhaps, even to its survival. The Arab and Islamic states have repeatedly declared their readiness to normalize relations with Israel within the context of a two-state solution. The U.S. and Arab countries should quickly agree on establishing a joint peacekeeping force to keep both sides safe 
in the context of implementing this two-state solution. This is what the entire world wants, and quite frankly, this is what the entire world needs to see. Everyone, thank you for making it to this point in the video, and as always, I appreciate your incredible support. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Most importantly, drop me a comment down below, as I'd love to hear your thoughts and your opinions on today's video about Israel and Hamas and what the future of this war is going to look like. Everyone, thanks for your support, and I'll see you in our next video soon.